this computer. And we'll put it on speaker view. And, uh, all right. Well, so thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Felicia Chavez, and I am the current president of the board of the local chapter of the United Nations Association. Um, for those of you who are new to the UNA, we are, we've actually been around since before the United Nations itself, because there needed to be an advocacy group to promote the idea of having a UN. So we're your local chapter. There's over 200 chapters throughout the United States. So anywhere you might be, you might wanna check out una-usa.org and find your local chapter. Largely, we're volunteer organizations. Um, and we've had a chapter here in Marin County for a number of years now. So I'm going to skip over to our slide presentation. It's about 15 minutes where I'm gonna set the stage for today's topic, which as we'll see is United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. And largely we're gonna be looking at Marin County in the context of goal 11 um, and SDG, um, Sustainable Development Goal 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, and how close or far we are uh, to the targets under that goal. Once I do this uh, sort of short presentation, then we're gonna switch over to Warren Wells, who's our guest speaker today from Marine County Bicycle Coalition. Thanks for joining us, Warren. Um, as you have seen, we are recording today's event. Uh, so it will be made available to those of you who registered um, in the days following this event. So moving to the official presentation. So for those of you who don't know, this is the grid of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals of 2030. So the idea is, can we get to number one, no poverty, number two, zero hunger, number three, good health and well-being, quality education, etc., by December of 2030, globally and locally. Today we're focused, as I mentioned, on number 11, sustainable cities and communities. And as you'll see, rather than having sort of a box for housing and a box for transportation um, and some other related topics, the people who contributed to the formation of the SDGs put um, these different aspects together because they're so tightly interlinked. The full text of the title of the goal is make cities inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. So I'm not gonna read all of this text, bad PowerPoint practice to put a bunch of text on a slide, <laughs> but I am gonna read three of the targets starting, and you don't have to strain your eyes reading um, the text, I'll read it out loud for you. So under each of the goals, um, as some of you know, there's a set of targets and under SDG 11, there's seven targets plus an A, B and a C. Number one is by 2030, ensure access for all to adequate, safe and affordable housing and basic services and upgrade slums. 11.2, by 2030, provide access to safe, affordable, accessible and sustainable transport systems for all, improving road safety, notably by expanding public transport with special attention to the needs of those in vulnerable situations, women, children, persons with disabilities, and older persons. And then we're skipping down to 11B. By 2030, substantially increase the number of cities and human settlements, adopting and implementing integrated policies and plans towards inclusion, resource efficiency, mitigation and adaptation to climate change, resilience to disasters, and develop and implement in line with the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction 2015 to 2030, holistic disaster risk management at all levels. We're not gonna focus so much on disaster preparedness today, although it may come into the conversation, as well as um, adaptation to climate change. We're mostly focused on housing and transportation um, today. So just a brief look at the global state with regard to SDG 11. 
And these little um, graphics and facts are from UN.org. Air pollution caused 4.2 million premature deaths in 2016. Only half of the world's urban population has convenient access to public transport as of 2019. And they're defining convenient access as 500 to 1,000 meters of walking distance um, to public transport. And I just want to point out here that the UN is kind of making this link between air pollution and access to public transport versus um, passenger vehicles, um, ostensibly um, fossil fueled passenger vehicles. Share of urban population living in slums rose to 24% in 2018. And um, of course, with the pandemic, that may very well have increased. So now we're just going to kind of zoom down to the local level. Um, usually we try to cover the, um, you know, the national and then the state, but given the topic of sustainable cities and communities, we're going to devote most of our time looking at Marin County specifically. So again, text heavy slide, but I'm going to read it out loud because I think it is important to inform our conversation. Um, this is starting with the topic of housing. So this is a screenshot of a page from the 1973 um, Marin County wide plan. So I keep wanting to call it um, a general plan, but it's also it's actually titled the Marin County wide plan 1973. And I'm going to see if I can find my chat and put that in here for anybody who wants to look at this later. So what they're saying back in 1973 is Marin's two basic goals for housing adopted by unanimous vote of the Board of Supervisors in 1971 are, and then they quote the 1971 um, uh, vote, where they say number one, to encourage continuation of social and economic diversity in Marin County communities through a variety of housing types, and two, to expand the supply of decent housing for low and moderate income families. And then they end their 1971 quote there. And then they continue, in fact, the reverse is happening. Between 1960 and 1970, the proportion of the county's housing in the low price category went down from 41.8% the 19.4%, while their proportion of high price units went up from 12.1% to 34.1%. This occurred despite a 46% increase in the overall supply of housing. As a result of rising prices, an increasing number of Marin's low and moderate income families, including especially young families and the elderly, are being forced to seek housing elsewhere. Census data from 1970 indicate that low and middle income families are in fact being squeezed out of Marin. And they talk about their tables 3.3 and 3.4, which show households and housing units in the low, moderate, middle and high categories for 1960 and 1970. These categories approximate what a family can reasonably spend on housing. Low and moderate income families, generally poorly served by the private market, are eligible for public housing, leased housing, or interest subsidized housing if they apply. Many workers who hold jobs in Marin cannot afford to live here, which deters attainment of the goal of a better economic balance. Of the 50, 57,700 Marin jobs in 1970, 12,600 were held by in commuters. A survey of these in, that's actually anecdotally, I believe it's raised to about half at this point. A survey of these in commuters by the Economic Development Committee revealed that over half believed that housing in Marin would be too expensive for them, though about one fourth definitely wished to move here. If this housing price trend continues during the next two decades and no programs are instituted to affect existing housing, it would be necessary for over 80% of newly constructed units to be in the low and middle value categories in order just to maintain the 1970 proportions in the city centered corridor. So again, historic data here from 1973 in Marin County. Um, and then this is jumping forward to a report titled Five County Bay Area Profile, Inequality and Economic Loss, the link for which I will put in the chat. And I believe it was 2000, 
2017 that it was published, um, but it was from 2014 data. So they're looking at the Bay Area overall here at the top, Alameda, San Francisco, San Mateo, Contra Costa, and then here at the bottom, Marin. The gray bar is share of jobs that are low wage. So this was saying that at that time, about 22% of jobs in Marin County were low wage. And then the green bar is share of rental housing units that are affordable. So if we think about what they were lamenting in terms of the 19%, you know, not exactly apples to apples, but what they were essentially calling affordable housing in 1973, um, and then by night by sorry 2014 down to nine percent um and we know since then it's only unfortunately very likely decreased even further um and putting more pressures on on lower and middle income families so now this is a quote from a local housing activist and organizer i did not ask her explicitly if i could <laughs> mention her name so i'm not mentioning her name but when I sent her the target, which was again, which we re read earlier, by 2030, ensure access for all to adequate, safe and affordable housing and basic services. And then I said, what direction are we going and how do we know this? And she wrote back and she said, if you want my honest opinion about your question, I'd say there's no hope that Marin will achieve that target. Right now, I'm working with some folks who are trying to get a rent control slash just cause evictions ordinance in Marin, and they're meeting strong resistance. Apparently it's too much to ask that Marin enact an ordinance that helps current renters stay in their homes. No surprise, of course, that renters are disproportionately made up of poor youth, seniors, and people of color. And again, um, local housing activist and organizer. So that was our look at housing um, locally, brief as it was. I'm also going to um, put a link in the chat to a blog I published a couple, two or three years ago um, about housing from a systems thinking perspective uh, in the area. So that's in the chat. And then um, if anybody has joined us today who um, has a depth of knowledge about the housing situation in Marin, I'm glad you're here and we will um, hope to integrate you into the conversation a little bit later. Right now, we're gonna switch over to the transit topic. And um, this is the cover page of Marin Transit. So they're the agency that runs the actual buses in Marin County. Their report titled Short Range Transit Plan 2020 to 2029. This is from January 2020. So for those who do not um, have a familiarity with riding the bus in Marin County, you're basically paying $2. $1 for youth and $1 for seniors and persons with disabilities. But generally speaking for your ride, it's around $2 generally. Um, now, <laughs> unfortunately um, for Marin Transit and other public transit, the majority of your funding does not come from fair revenue, so that two or one dollars. You're actually, as an agency, heavily dependent on all kinds of different taxes from all kinds of different places. So again, over email, um, I asked a um, local transit um, organizer and activist, and her name is Wendy Callens, and um, she put me in touch actually with Warren, our guest today. And I, so I sent her the, the target related to transit, which again, we'll review is by 2030, provide access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport systems for all. Improving road safety, notably by expanding public transport with special attention to the needs of those in vulnerable situations, women, children, persons with disabilities, and older persons. And I asked her, to what degree is Marine County on track to achieving this? Do we have great walking and biking areas or do we have to work to do to get there? And her reply, um, and we'll see, she um, had a number of things to say about this that are insightful. She said, Marin has been very proactive in creating great walking and biking areas. Our transit system is not very convenient or accessible. The new general manager for SMART is looking to renew the promise of better connections between SMART and buses and Marin Transit does what it can with what little funding it has. For improvements, it's better to look Bay Area wide. And she continued saying there's a strong movement to create a seamless transit system for the whole Bay Area, which I believe for those of you who pay to have experienced public transit in the Bay Area, um, that sounds like a good idea. So there's a group called Seamless Bay Area has been leading the charge, but the pandemic provided a unique opportunity to rethink our disjointed 27 transit agencies and look for ways to provide better options, especially for essential workers who don't work regular commute hours. The Metropolitan Transit Commission created a blue ribbon committee whose first task was to address the breakdown of transit ridership during the pandemic and to disperse the federal funding 
But then the committee pivoted to look to the future. The first step was to look at fair integration and a pilot study is getting underway in 2030 for low income housing and college students that will provide a more seamless transfer between systems. There's a bill before the state Senate, SB 916, which will pave the way for a network manager to coordinate between the transit agencies. All of this work will benefit Marin by providing a much smoother and more efficient system. And again, that was from Wendy. And I asked her one more question, um, which was, how do the areas of housing, transportation, and disaster preparedness work together? Do we integrate these functions in Marin County, or do they tend to work separately? What can be done to improve interstitial planning and work? And her reply is that there is not a lot of coordination between these. Housing is supposed to be directed towards transit priority areas, but anti-housing activists generally succeed in eliminating those options. Again, she's um, sort of echoing what our earlier quote was saying, especially around smart stations. Some cities like San Rafael do strive to direct housing towards transit, but are often thwarted. The county is doing a good job with disaster preparedness, but not necessarily in coordination with housing and transit. And I'll just say, I also spoke with um, somebody from Marin Transit who kind of echoed this uh, second point here, which was, you know, I asked her, do you guys work with a housing authority? Do you guys work with developers, you know, in, in planning public transit? And um, this other person also said, she said, my experience is that we're fairly reactive, that we hear about a housing development. We hear about changes. We hear about road construction. We're not necessarily told ahead of time. So it does sound like Marin County, probably like most places, has um, room for improvement in terms of that um, coordinating efforts. And now, happily, we're going to turn to Warren Wells, Burren County Bicycle Coalition. And um, just to get started, Warren, thanks for taking time out of your busy uh, schedule today. Um, and I just wanted to flag with regard to the SDG. So we're looking at 11 sustainable cities and communities, but very clearly that relates to all these different SDGs, in particular, reduced inequalities, good health and well being, um, poverty issues, climate change. So please feel free to. Um, share your wisdom across those topics. And I'll turn it over to you, Warren. Thanks so much, Lisa. And uh, thanks everybody for having me. I really appreciate it. Again, my name is Warren Wells. I'm the Policy and Plan Director for the Marin County Bicycle Coalition. Uh, we're an organization focused on trying to make the, the County of Marin more accessible, more bikeable um, for people trying to get around for recreation and for their, for their daily needs. Um, so I, I don't have a uh, formal presentation. It was kind of a, a busy week for me, so I hope you'll pardon me there. but. Um, I'm just going to kind of like run you through um, kind of the stuff that I'm thinking about and and how we think that uh, our, you know, bicycling and, and walking um, play a part of, of becoming, of helping Marin become a more sustainable place. So, and I'm glad, Felicia, I'm glad you kind of tied this to these different areas like health, climate change, um, poverty, and sustainability broadly, because um, I think there's a role to play kind of in all of those. So I'll kind of go down the list a little, the list a little bit there. Um, starting with climate change, this is, I think it's on a lot of our minds these days. Um, we know that in the state of California, um, transportation writ large makes up about 40%, so two fifths of all greenhouse gas emissions. In Marin County, that's higher with most cities uh, actually, Sorry, so, so in the state is 20, so 48% total, 28% is, is just passenger cars. Um, in Marin County, most cities, their transportation share makes up either over half or close to it of all greenhouse gas emissions. So obviously there's other areas um, to address that, but transportation is a big one. If you're ignoring transportation, you're really gonna miss out on a lot of gains you can make. Um, so kind of that, let's set that aside. Um, Oh, and, and so while, while, you know, our total emissions have been declining uh, on the city, city by basis uh, in the last number of years, most of that has been brought about by the, the energy generation mix, the fact that our electricity is increasingly generated by wind and solar, less by gas and coal. So we've kind of seen gains there, but, but transportation um, has remained stubbornly high. That's kind of the climate change thing. We, you know, we have, really have to address that. Um, then on the rate the, on sort of health and safety, um, there's kind of two issues when we think about in transportation. One of them is is the way, the role that air quality has in transportation. We know that um, bad air quality, PM two point five, you know, particularly from automobiles and heavy truck traffic, 
uh, is, is a real characteristic of our transportation system. People have much higher rates of elevated risk of asthma and, and heart disease and other lung conditions you know, who have to live near freeways or, or busy roads. So there's this kind of like the ambient health and then there is um, kind of the day-to-day -day health. Everybody here you know, has had a close call crossing the street where someone blew a stop sign um, or maybe you've tried to ride your bike or you're not comfortable riding your bike um, you know, be, because of, of safety concerns. And, you know, that's, you know, while we, while we are advocates of biking here, you know, we take those safety concerns, concerns seriously. America is a far too dangerous place to, to get around at all, whether you're walking, driving, or riding a bicycle. We just saw data from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration um, this past week that 2021 was the deadliest year on America's roads uh, since 19... Since 2009 or 2011, I think, and the biggest one year increase since 1975 since we started keeping track. So it was a 10% increase um, in the last year alone. And unfortunately, as much as I'd love to say that um, Marin is the exception here, you know, we're not. We've actually seen Marin County has seen road deaths, countywide road deaths go from two in 2010 to, to 20 in 2020. Um, that's a big jump percentage wise. Um, and the number of people, the number of pedestrians hit by cars every year in Marin has been rising every year for the last decade until 2020 when they when they fell some somewhat. So we're really not going the right direction um, when it comes to safety. Um, you know, and then and then there is this the issue of um, you know uh, poverty and and uh, how do we make places sustainable places where you don't have to spend all your, uh, you know, large amount of your income getting around. And this is where, you know, I, I think that there's a lot to be said for the, uh, the admin of electric, electric vehicles. We're supportive of them. Um, you know, it's a great, it's a, it's a great way of reducing our, our kind of like our energy use, but the issue, one issue is they are out of reach for a lot of people. Um, uh, you know, even with even a highly subsidized, you know, car still costs maybe ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to purchase. So, what are some ways that we can help people, whether they're children or older adults in fixed income, or people who don't have a don't have a high paying job, can help themselves get around? Um, so that's you know where we're um, where where we think that improving walking and cycling infrastructure really um, addresses a lot of the. Uh, the, you know, these multiple crises we're, we're facing from uh, greenhouse gas emissions to air quality, to road safety, to, to you know, access and inequality. Um, I, I can pause there and see if anybody has any questions or I can kind of keep, I, I don't, I don't want to give you a long lecture without any slides to, to come back to. Well, you know, I just wanted to jump in and ask Warren if you could kind of give us a sense based on your focus on this area. And those those statistics were super helpful. So thank you. Depressing, but very helpful. Um, if you could kind of give us a sense of like, like where, like if we were grading on a curve, let's say, uh, within California, within the nation or globally, like where is Marin positioned in terms of our sort of pedestrian and bicycle friendly infrastructure? Um, it's, it, it, let's just talk about, um, I would say, better than most of America, um, maybe better than most of California, way, 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 way worse than Western Europe and East Asia. Um, just it's kind of throw it out there for a quick answer. Um, you know, Marin, I think it's very clear that Marin has, has you know, Marin is the home of mountain biking and, and is, a, is, a, is like, you know, a, a road biker's mecca, right? Like Marin you know, it's a wonderful place to ride a bike. I don't want to be too down on this. And we have put some incredible investments, um, you know, in, into our into our county so far. The, the Mill Valley Saucedo Path is just, a, you know, a complete gem. The Cal Park Hill Tunnel, the, the tunnel that SMART goes through between San Rafael and Larkspur, you know, was was a, a game changer. I mean, it, it lets you go take a flat ride, you know, where you had, used to have go up to go over, over a hill or go up Wolf Bait or something. We, we've put these amazing investments in. The smart pathway, which we built, you know, miles of pathway in the last um, 10 years. But unfortunately, what the issue is, is there's still, there's no network. The, the, the places where it is safe to ride a bike, where I can ride with my 68-year-old mom and my sister with her two-year-old and everyone feels comfortable, those places, while they exist, they don't connect to one another. And so, where there might be one a couple of miles from your house, if you're making a four-mile trip 
and you ride on it for a little bit, but then you're crossing over 101 here and you're going through a hairy intersection there. And, you know, like any transportation infrastructure, uh, it's only as good as its, as its weakest part, right? Like if you were on the freeway, if you were driving a car on the freeway, but you had to get off and drive on a, on a rutted dirt road for two miles before getting back on the freeway, like you might avoid that trip or you would take another route. And so that's kind of the experience that I think a lot of people have trying to ride bicycles around Marin is that there are some really great places. And if that was everywhere, we'd be done. Um, but but that the gaps between them uh, ha have not been built with what we call all ages and abilities, AAA, AAA bike facilities, where you can take your grandmother and your, you know, like you know, an eight, 80 year old and an eight year old all feel comfortable in them. And instead we have kind of got taken the, a lot of the low hanging fruit cities will say, Hey, we're putting in a new bike lane. And what they're doing is striping a five foot section on the road next to fast traffic and opening car doors. And kind of lo and behold, only people, a lot of people who look like me, like kind of relatively risk tolerant 30 somethings or 40 somethings ride on it. And a lot of people say like, no, thanks. That doesn't feel safe. And so, so we miss out um, on a lot of potential riders. So, so this is where I'm going to kind of, I'll pull another couple of facts and then talk about um, the international comparison. So, so Marin, uh, so the transportation authority of Marin did a, 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 a vision study a couple of years ago. And there was, they did a, a survey of 4,000 Marin residents. Maybe some of you answered it. Um, and they found, there's some really great findings in there. One of them is that um, among people, among people who currently drive to work. So this is, you know, people who are currently commuting by cars, over half of them, 52%, said that they would like to ride bikes more for transportation and recreation than they do currently. And that's a finding, you know, that was, we found that here in Marin, that's a finding that is echoed across the nation. There's a researcher named Jennifer Dill at Portland State University, who's one of the premier researchers on, on, on bicycling uh, nationwide. And it's about that number, you know, somewhere between 48 and 60% of, of, of all adults are fall into what a group she calls interested, but concerned. So these are people who, are able to ride a, you know, are physically able to ride a bike and, and curious about it, would like to do it for maybe for short trips, but don't feel safe doing it all the time. So these are people who might go out for a ride on, you know, the, the Mill Valley Saucedo pathway or, you know, along the beach in Los Angeles, but are not going to, certainly not going to take, take the lane on Sir Francis Drake and wouldn't even feel safe, wouldn't feel that safe on the bike lane on Miller Ave in Mill Valley. Um, and so that's that for me, I see that that 52% Marin is this huge unmet demand, this huge latent demand for people who want to ride more. And importantly, even if you aren't in that 51%, even if you're like, no way, no how for me, I'm going to drive my car. Making our cities safer to walk and bike or to ride bikes will make some of those people you're stuck behind in traffic who would like to be biking but don't feel safe, they get on a bike and your drive is easier. So you can keep driving, but by making the world safer to ride, we get cars off the road. And that makes that thing makes things better for everyone. Actually, uh, Waze, the, the navigation software, they did an international survey in so, uh, 2019, trying to figure out what is the best country to drive in? Like, what's the, what's the one with the least traffic, best, best driving experience? Do you know what the answer was? The Netherlands. <laughs> They, famously the nicest city to ride the right nicest country to ride bikes in it's because in a city where people have the options the people who need to drive and the people who don't need to and don't really want to drive they don't great that's super helpful <laughs> and i just want to bring in here um uh, oh great thanks it looks like we'll get to you in one second rick i just wanted to add in <sighs> Um, I, a few years back, well, first of all, I want to acknowledge the gentleman who passed away here in the San, San Geronimo Valley just within the last few months who was hit by a driver. In January, yeah. In January, yeah. Um, so this was this was within like five miles of my house, um, and he was hit and killed by a driver on Sir Francis Strike. Um, and it's not the first time that's happened in the years that I've lived here. Um, and... So I just wanted to bring in another, you know, other, you know, road fatalities in terms of wildlife. Um, I feel like I feel like 
wildlife road fatalities have this sort of subtle undercurrent impact on all of us because we see this you know, really disturbing sight all the time. And for those of us who care about wildlife, you know, it's a, it's a sensitive moment when you're, you know, especially if you've, like I have had the really unpleasant experience of actually seeing, for example, a deer get physically hit on the road by a car. And so I did some investigation around, you know, wildlife corridors and wildlife safety around roads and I found that there was really no concerted effort in Marin in, for wildlife corridors or trying to make the roads safer for wildlife. And it just made me think about how, you know, kind of what you were saying about road safety. It's like when you improve the, the walking, biking infrastructure such that it is really uh, separate and safe, um, then you have fewer cars on the road. And, you know, a lot of it is like, you know, narrowing roads, adding in curves, dropping the speed limit. Um, and, and those, that's going to improve the situation for wildlife, the safety for wildlife, as well as for people, uh, whether you're in a car or on a bike or walking. Um, so I just wanted to add that, that little bit in there. So Rick, I saw you had your hand up. Yes, thank you, Felicia. And thank you, Warren, for your uh, comments. Um, <clears throat> there's certainly a great case to be made for bicycles as an alternative form of transportation. Uh, people who uh, have to commute to work uh, can be encouraged to use bicycles instead of cars and um, get uh, greenie points for that, as it were. Uh, people who go around town doing their errands, going to the bakery or the barber shop or the bank, instead of using a car, uh, that uh, improves um, air quality. <clears throat> um, but you seem to have elided all of this with uh, bicycling uh, recreationally. Bicycling basically is a hobby. And I wonder if you um, have a case you can make for spending public money on what is essentially a hobby. Um, well, so we don't see bicycling as, I mean, bicycling can be a hobby, just like driving can be a hobby um, and farming can be a hobby. Uh, you know, I. I'm not sure I understand the question. You know, a lot of our advocacy uh, at Marin County Bicycle Coalition is, you know, first based on safety. Felicia talked about the the, the man, uh, Pastor Greg Chisholm, who was killed by a driver in January while biking for a hobby on Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. Uh, he was hit behind by a motorist and killed immediately. So we, so certainly we want to, you know, we're focused whether, however you're getting around a bike and honestly, however you're trying to get around at all, we want our roads to be safer. So, so you know, whether you're sh going shopping or whether you're going for a, a, a ride. Um, so that that's you know, we're very focused on improving the safety of our roads. And Felicia talked about, you know, you have nailed, you know, nailed them, narrowing lanes, lowering speeds. You know, if if a person is hit by a car going 20 miles per hour, there's a 10% chance they'll die. If they're hit by, by a car going 40 miles an hour, there's only a 10% chance they'll live. So so we that's the, you know. First, we want to push our, you know, to make it so our roads are safe for people, whether they're walking, biking, or driving or on the bus. Second, a lot of our advocacy, Rick, is around transportation riding. I don't, I think that if you looked at what, what we do as an organization, we're very much focused on how do we improve the experience for people taking short trips around town. Look at our work on the, the Second Street and Santa Fowl on Miller Avenue, on the Smart Pathway. Um, I don't think we are as focused, maybe as, as you might indicate, as like talking about Route 1 or, you know, Lucas Valley Road. That's not where, you know, that's not where a lot of, or at least my work takes place. We do, our, our organization, um, so I work on the kind of the, the, the road and transportation side of, of the organization. And my coworker, Tom Boss, he works on the, um, the trails and off-road uh, part of the program. So he, they do, they work with the water district and uh, Marin County Parks on, on trail access. That's different than transportation spending. Those are different pots of money. Great, thanks. So um, I just wanted to ask you, Warren, but uh, another question, but did anybody else have any questions for Warren before I jump in with a further question? Yeah, Ro? Uh, this might be slightly off topic, Warren, but um, do you know anything about what's happening with the 2030 goals 
for electrifying the Marin Transit bus fleets? You know, I don't know anything about that. I'm sorry. Thanks. David? Yeah, hi, thanks. I'm uh, driving, but uh, safely so, so I will stay off video for the moment. But um, my question is one about, I guess, language and messaging. Um, so we hear sustainable so often that I, I wonder if sometimes it begins to lose meaning. And so um, conceptually, I think we all understand what sustainable means, but um, what, what else does it mean? Or maybe sometimes to flip language to get a better sense of what sustainable is, is to consider what's unsustainable. But can you sort of get at um, sustainability and maybe some metrics sure. around it in general terms? How do, we, how do we know when something is sustainable or not sustainable? And what does that sort of actually and really mean? Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you my answers. I don't know that these aren't, aren't handed, out, handed down on a tablet or anything, but um, you know, so sustainability, I think it's, you know, just kind of definitionally, it's like, what can you keep doing, you know, indefinitely or for a very long time? Um, or, or what, you know, what, you know, conversely or inversely, you know, what runs out of gas, you know, kind of what runs out of gas, what can't go on forever? Um, and so, you know, so for those things, I think like, it's like, you know, energy and money kind of writ large, you know, so, you know, and, 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 you know, climate change. So I think first something, you know, to have a sustainable, to have a sustainable city or a sustainable state, um, sustainable world, you know, we need to stabilize the, um, the, our greenhouse gas emissions. So whatever that looks like, that means trying to live our lives, like eat, visit, play, learn uh, in, in ways that don't involve burning a lot of fossil fuel. That's kind of like, I, I can't sugarcoat it any more than that. Um, and so, for me, that's the starting point. So how do, how do we do that? Um, and so there, you know, I can kind of break that down in other ways, you know, so like, what is our energy output? Um, there was a research piece I saw uh, online a few weeks, a month or so ago about like, what does it take? I can look this up. You know, how, how much energy consumption does it take to live like the good life? Like the, uh, you know, a, a kind of a modern, what we would consider, you know, a modern high amenity life. And globally, um, I'm just looking this up. Um, globally, I think it's it's around seventy five gigajoules of energy. It, it's a it's a it's a metric. Um, each gigajoule is like I think uh, eighty gallons of gas. And Americans, on average, we consume four times that. So we consume the four times just in our daily lives the global average of what it takes to reach that high quality life. So. I think we could. It seems like there's a lot of head or a lot of headroom for us to to reduce that. Um, so we we could get to we could still keep living our good lives, just have to live our lives in a way that looks more like other people who have lower energy usage. Last thing I would say on sustainability is like what what um, what can we do that doesn't that doesn't kind of break break the bank? Um, and you know this is an area which I you know I hate to sound like a broken record, but um, the infrastructure that we spend, the infrastructure that we build for the, the moving and, and storage of, of automobiles as sort of a, a primary transportation mode is very, very, very high. Um, every mile of highway that you, every lane mile of highway that you build costs usually the state um, $28,000 per year in perpetuity. So we're widening, you know, US 101 between Petaluma and Novato, it's 15 miles, one lane direction, 30 lane miles. I can't do the math. It's like $6 million, $6 million a year in perpetuity we're paying to maintain those new miles. Um, and it kind of like, you know, and, and we know that when we widen highways, more traffic comes. Anyone who, if you ever lived in LA, you know, they spent years widening the 405 between the, the San Fernando Valley and the West Side, $1.3 billion doing it, which is a lot of money. Um, and then three months later, the traffic had, you know, after it opened, the traffic was back to what it was before. This is a phenomenon called induced demand that we've known about for a hundred years. Um, so, so what gets us a high, you know, kind of input out, like in ratio from input to output, I would say that's another 
area of sustainability? Can we keep spending this amount of money um, to get something out of it? And, you know, with respect to, to, to roads, you know, we don't spend enough, we don't spend enough money. Um, the roads are really expensive. And also the money that we spend on roads, so our gas taxes are too low to cover them. Like the federal gas tax hasn't been solvent for a decade. Like money comes, money comes from the general fund. So, so drivers get more out of the roads than, than they pay in. It just kind of gets collected. It, it gets paid by all, all the, all taxpayers of which I number, despite not owning a car. Um, so anybody who rides bus or walks or, you know, is, can't you know it's blind and can't own a car they're they, they're paying for the roads for everybody um so those would be i guess uh, that's my answer about sustainability great thanks oh, for that thank thanks for your question too um we just want to give a little mention to the words restorative or regenerative and even synergy or synergistic um there's all these other words that people are kind of playing with and trotting out and trying on for improving the word sustainability. So roads are expensive. They're um, somewhat fairly dangerous. <laughs> There's a carbon emissions issue. Um, they're also kind of loud. <laughs> like I was on a hike the other day and I noticed that I couldn't get far enough away from Sir Francis Drake to not hear it. Um, but I see Stacy, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, hi. Um, I've been working a lot with uh, the safe routes to schools of my daughter's school here in Novato. And um, my question relates to, so we were trying to encourage people to bike and walk and, and all that kind of thing. And really it's turning out like maybe the only way to get more people to do that is to not let them drop their kids off in the turnaround in, the, uh, in front of the school. So in general, I'm just curious, um, are we, is Marin thinking about areas in which they would just not allow parking, not allow driving as a way to just make it less easy to drive versus trying to like make a bike path, but you still never took away the advantage of driving? Does that make sense in terms of the Absolutely. It, so the, the, the tough thing, and this is kind of, I was going to close this, you're anticipating uh, some of my point here is that the, the challenges to, to making Marin more walkable and bikeable are not technical. They are not ones of resource. They are not problems of engineering. They are entirely political. And so we have a choice. And so we've seen, so to, to cut your exact question, um, uh, there was an initiative in, in England, I can't remember which city it started in, but it spread to a number of cities in England um, called school streets. And the idea is just around the school for, you know, the hours around, on like, you know, school start and school and the end of bell, if they have that there, like no cars in the street, unless it's an emergency vehicle, just so that those last few blocks around the school are safe for kids to, to you know, to walk or ride their bikes to. Um, huge success, you know, you know, it helps, helps parents feel that their kids are safe getting to school as opposed to having every single car drive up to the very entrance of school and drop their kid off. I, I know this personally, a good friend, her younger sister was had her, a tennis career ended by being hit in a school crosswalk. You know, it, it's, you know, it, the, 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 the safety threat is real. Um, similarly in London, so that's kind of on the school sense on, in London, in England, yeah, in, in London, you know, they, and actually in, in you know, just across the Bay in Berkeley, you, you find a lot of streets that are, um, you know, diverted where they're, they've just prevent, you know, you can drive to your house if you live in the neighborhood, but you can't cut through the neighborhood. There's going to be some sort of diverter, which makes you turn kind of zigzag to get through. So it just makes more sense to stay on the main street as opposed to kind of using ways and cutting through the neighborhood. In, in London, they call these low traffic neighborhoods. And these have had a huge impact on improving the walkability and bikeability um, of, of, of those places. And we see it and, and people then change their lives because of that or change their behaviors. I would say in Marin, we, you know, we saw the slow streets um, in Marin and San Francisco and Oakland and Berkeley um, during the pandemic, um, you know, giving people, because it was a COVID response, giving people places to recreate outdoors um, in a socially distanced way. We've seen a number of those programs rolled back, um, you know, in, in Oakland and Berkeley to a degree in San Francisco. Um, and I think there's not enough imagination currently or not enough vision about, about how, you know, transformative for people's experience walking and biking it can be if they don't have to worry about a car rushing past them every 10 seconds. 
And even if you can, you can still maintain car access, but just stopping car through traffic has a huge effect um, on, on that perception and perception and reality of safety. So I would say um, not as much to your question, not as much some, not as much as I would like. Great. And I'm just, I'm just curious, Stacey, were you familiar with that program in London or England? Because I wonder if it would inform, what was it called again, Warren? School? Well, they have, school, it's called School Streets. Um, I believe that's what it's called. So can we get school streets in Novato, mm -hmm. Stacey? We'd love to get school streets. I mean, <laughs> we'll, we'll like our safe routes school team will work on it. It, you know, it, but again, like this is what I'm saying. It, it that's a, there's no, there's no mystical technology here. There's just like, just some people putting out a little like cone saying no through traffic for the next couple hours. Um, you know, so, so it, meaning it, it is an entirely a political choice to, to make that. I, I guess I'm just curious, you know, if we kind of go back to the, presentation that I did earlier with regard to housing and the sort of pushback to affordable housing and housing around the smart train and all of that. Um, when, if you show up to a city council meeting in Novato, say, and you're like, yay, school streets, like they did in England, are there people who show up and say, no, bad, like, 100%. there's, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's hard to get, I mean, it's hard to get you know, it, it is my work as an organizer to get in, to get merely as many people out saying yes to things as there will be people saying no to things, which is not to say that that is necessarily representative of the community. Um, you know, we see this in transportation, we see this in housing, that, that there, you know, there are people on either end, there's bike advocates like me, and there's a bunch of people on the no side who kind of don't want anything to change because I don't, I don't blame anybody for not wanting to change, things to change. If you like your neighborhood, like why want it to change? Like, I get that. Um, I think the world is changing and we have to change to, to, to be more to with it. That's but but I understand where people are coming from. Um and then you have a whole bunch of people in the middle who are like, huh, but they're not gonna show up to the meeting. <laughs> so then it kind of and you know, so then public meetings, whether in housing and transportation, end up being kind of a food fight between the people, the no people over here and the yes people over here, and the city council members or the reality TV show judges who decide who wins. Um, which is not pleasant for anybody. And so it keeps out all those kind of people in the middle. They're like, I don't want to show up to that. That seems too crazy. This happened in San Rafael. There was a project, I'm not sure where everyone lives. Um, there was a project on Point San Pedro Road recently where the county and the city were going to reduce one of the two eastbound lanes. So it's two eastbound lanes going out toward the quarry. They're going to reduce that to one because the traffic out there is pretty low and there's a lot of speeding and there's no bike lanes. So it was kind of win, win, win. But a bunch of people showed up and said no and the or said they didn't want it. And the city council changed their mind. Um, so, sigh. but I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> sigh indeed. I, but I'd love to, I'd love to, sorry if I'm interrupting you. No, go you ahead. Have, I do want to talk about housing. You know, this is where, you know, you, you opened with this that, and I could not agree more, I mean, you saw me nodding my head, that housing and transportation are two sides of the same coin. And you really, it's hard to talk about one without the other. And I think actually speaking for my profession, I think that bicycle advocates, well, we like to stay in our own lane, you know, so to speak, we, we have an expertise. And also, you know, it's, we get yelled at enough if we just talk about biking, maybe we don't talk about housing and be, become less, uh, even, even more controversial. But but I think uh, it's impossible to miss the fact that a bikeable city, I mean, you know, um, Rick talked about earlier about, you know, why are we subsidizing a hobby? Well, the reason people, the reason pe more people aren't riding for transportation actually is that things are too far apart. You know, it's one thing to ask, you know, it's one thing to ask someone to bike four blocks to the grocery store. Where I grew up in suburban Maryland, the grocery store was five miles away e each way. And like my mom, like God love her, she's not going to bike ten miles to 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 pick up some you know some flour and eggs. So so making a place that is where where I mean ideally even just the car trips are short. Which, so where things are close to each other is is reduces your your vehicle miles traveled, your your greenhouse gas emissions, but also unlocks the ability for people to walk and bike, which are tools that just work better over shorter distances uh, to where they're going. That and this is not even talk about jobs. You know, so you mentioned 
that figure from 1970, I actually looked it up while you were talking. It's, it's worse than you think. Um, close to two thirds of people who work in Marin live outside of Marin. It's 62%. And that same TAM, Transportation Authority Marin, study they did a couple years ago, um, I'll say these numbers slowly just because it's, it's worth like really taking them in. If you work in Marin and live here too, on average, you drive 17 miles every day. That's your average trade. You live in Marin and work in Marin, 17 miles, which is like a fair amount, but not, uh, not, not an ungodly amount. If you work in Marin and live outside of Marin, on average, you're driving 49 miles every day, an additional 32 miles. So another, another hour in the car. Um, that has a mental health impact. That has a greenhouse gas emissions impact. Has a hell has a traffic impact. Like that's what the traffic on the Richard Sandville Bridge and the and the 101 are. Um, it has a cost impact. You know, every person who has to cross the Richmond Sandville Bridge paying seven dollars each way, five days a week, you know, 250 days a year, that's a lot. And so, you know, if we want to be, you know, kind of welcoming to these people who are happy to have like serving us coffee or scooping ice cream or making sandwiches or, or whatever, you know, taking care of our kids, we need to be, I think we need to be welcoming to them. And when we do, we also create cities where people, it's people live close to where they work. Um, and then which, which reduces the, the, the toll on our transportation system um, greatly because, because walking and biking kind of take up no space and, and don't wear it on the roads. Yeah, thanks for making those connections. That's really helpful, um, especially like the mental health piece. I've been uh, working on a, a, a project recently and I feel like that piece is often kind of not necessarily overlooked. It's mentioned, but it's not like really explained or, you know, like, like, like I was just kind of flipping through this 1973 countywide plan and I just happened to notice that there's a whole thing about noise. And I'm like, noise, oh wow, they were thinking about noise. But um, also I just wanted to, to quickly share with, with everybody, um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. This is from that, that same plan from 1973 and it's like 1973, they're talking about <laughs> high density <laughs> residential structures up here, apartments over the stores, uh, you know, the theater, nightlife, and low look, the roads going under the community, kind of underground, <laughs> connect, you know, so this is like, <laughs> once upon a time, we were trying to get there, and <laughs> we kind of veered off somewhere, but um, I'd love for you to send that to me, I'd, I'd love to, yeah, I'll just that. put, I'll just put this, this was page 34, um, cool. and if I can find my chat, I'll pop this back in the chat box. Oh, great, thanks. So yeah, Cornelius. Yeah, so I have I have kind of two two questions. Um, I mean, and there, and one is a little esoteric, but they they relate to each other. One is like you use the word um, like mystical technology, and, and really um, that's what the bicycle is. You know, I mean, so you know we're, we're in a time where people are not in a position to deny like energy and pollution crisis. And the bicycle, out of all the things that Homo sapiens have come up with, has, has this maximum energy efficiency uh, math, right? Or whatever it is. And so that itself could be like a model beyond the goals of, you know, the nuts and bolts of like your mission and what you're working on, just, just the bicycle itself becoming especially in Marin where people are always having to think about it. I think that I like David's question because that's just what we see. Like we don't, we don't really see, we see people parking their bikes with their kids at the grocery store a bit. But when you live out here on Sir Francis Drake, you see hordes of people with their fancy spandex uh, on the weekend, like, like they're not getting groceries. So, so that's just, that's just what we see. Um, but, but yeah, like that, that idea of like, the, like the cult of the bicycle as an icon of energy efficiency and what humans are capable of. It has all these uh, these benefits in terms of uh, health and, and, and breathing and not being in traffic and things like that. So that's kind of like part one. And the people who I think would respond to that would be young people that are that are like really not in a position to say, yeah, I don't really think there's any energy problem. Everything seems like it's going to be fine for us. 
uh, they're they're not really saying that. So are you? Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I love I love the the cult of bicycle mysticism. I mean, I remember myself. I just try to let my you know colors fly to. I don't know. I love a bike. I, you know, I I and kind of going back to what Felicia called out. You know, like my I, I last so I last owned a car in twenty and seven years next week in 2015. I had a job. I was driving 25 miles each way and being stuck in traffic the entire way is in Baltimore, and it it was like really wearing me down. <laughs> and so I quit the job and got a job a mile away from the house, and you know rode a bike there and walked into snowing. Um, you know, so I, you know, so that, that, that's kind of where I came from personally. I didn't start riding a bike until I was, you know, 20, 25, 26. Um, so, you know, I think that, so your question, you know, I think that there is, you know, I, the bicycle is like famously the, the most energy efficient means of locomotion that humans have yet to devised. That's all cool. And I love riding a bike, but, you know, but it also has, you know, you have to skip traffic. You never, I never sit in traffic. The only thing, the only thing that bums me out about biking is being almost hit all the time. <laughs> you know, like that, that bums me out. And for whatever weird reason, I'm like kind of risk tolerant and do it. But the reason, the reason we are just seeing all the Lycra dads on Lucas Valley Road, as opposed to moms with their kids going to the grocery store is because those people do not feel safe. And if you go to other places in the world, um, you see that's wildly different. If you go to Japan, um, in Japan, uh, Women make up 55% of all of all bike trips. In America, it's uh, 30%. In other places, you see older people, older adults riding bicycles. In in countries as diverse as Japan, Germany, and the Netherlands, you see a kind of across the board. In, in America, people um, 65 to 70 only. Um, 0 0.7, 0 0.7 percent of all trips by people 65 to 70 are made on a bike. In Germany, it's 10 percent. In Japan, it's 12. In the Netherlands, it's 28 percent. And so we have, you know, we have made those places have made have made have made a world. Regardless, of, the interest is there. They've made a world where those people feel safe doing it. And if we don't make people safe feeling it, doing it, only weirdos like me will ever ride bikes. Um, or you know the the or, you know, or like her dad's on Sir Francis Drake. Um, and it's just about catering to that most, most risky and tolerant person. And I think about my 68 year old mom and my sister with her two year old. If we cater to those people, that's when we see people voting with their feet and, and, and riding at rates that America has never seen. That's that maybe Davis. Great, thanks. Yeah, I feel like the safety point is, um, it just keeps coming back around in this conversation. And it, it I'm, I'm just flashing to something I heard. It was something like, I think it's called like the, it's like the last girl policy or something like that, where if you make sure that every last girl is well attended to, then because of the nature of hierarchy and the structure of societies, then you know you've attended to, to everybody by the time you get to the last girl. Um, so I, I heard a rumor out here somewhere that Marsha, you may have raised your hand at some point and I might have missed you. Um, yeah, I just, I was thinking about Marin and, and I don't know what the population of the percentage of older people who live here and I would love, I'm very athletic, I would love to ride a bike, but I don't think it's a good idea at age 78 for me to do that. So um, I'm not sure, you know, how you, um, you know, base your facts because of your statistics, because we do have such a high proportion um, of older people. What I do is I drive um, to someplace and then I, I try to walk everywhere and get everything and, and bring it back to the car. So in other words, I, I really am conscious all the time of, of thinking about, um, you know, how much I'm driving, which is, you know, I don't drive that much anymore because I'm really clear if I'm going to go someplace, I'm going to do everything, but I, but I like to walk between, it. but again, you know, your point about how um, everything is far apart <laughs> in our country. I have a friend from Paris, <laughs> she, you know, she's visited her son and she just walks along the highways, you know, from to the grocery to Safeway from where he lives. And she's just appalled uh, by the way that we don't have transportation and that we, you know, everything is so far apart from, from where people live. 
versus where they shop. So anyway, that's my little piece. Yeah, um, and just I'll, I'll answer that a little bit. And so I, one thing I haven't talked about um, so far is is the rise of electric bicycles. Um, electric bicycles have really taken the world by storm in the last you know five or six years. Perhaps you've seen people out riding them. Sometimes it's kind of hard even if you don't know what to look for, you don't even know it's an e-bike. People are just kind of going too faster than they should be uphill. Um, and e-bikes have have been a really incredible tool in my experience for actually unlocking kind of those two groups of people, you know, parents who are like hauling groceries or children or older adults who just, you know, especially in a, a topographically rich place such as Marin, you know, have a hard time. I have a hard time going up hills, you know, like Lord does in 50 years. Um, you know, I have a, so I have a buddy whose dad, you know, he used to be road, he used to be a road record, you know, rider, but he's in his sixties, um, you know, and so Mark, my friend Mark had a trouble riding with him until his dad got an e-bike and now they can ride together and Mark has to chase his dad up the hill. Um, I actually met a gentleman just riding in San Rafael a few weeks ago. He, I didn't ask him how old he is because I, I try to be polite if I had to guess. He was, I would say he is in his early eighties um, and he was riding an electric tricycle. He, he lives over in Green Bay. He was doing some shopping in downtown San Rafael, had ridden you know, through the Cal Park Hill tunnel that I was talking about on the, on the smart pathway. I, I stopped, I kind of flagged him down, so I was curious. He had it for a few years and he said he like, didn't like driving anymore, didn't, didn't trust himself on the road and gets a little bit of his exercise and still gets where he needs to go on that tricycle. He happens to be lucky enough to live in a place, in one of the few places in Marin, I would say, where he can, you know, hop on the path, a fully separate path all the way from his house in Green Bray, all the way up to downtown San Rafael. And so, so lo and behold, you see this older adult who I, I, I'm sure he's not out there in Lycra on Sir Francis Drake. He's just getting his groceries or, you know, who knows, um, get, choosing, you know, choosing to get around on the infrastructure we have built for him. And so that, that's how I see that, um, again, especially with the hills, I think e-bikes are going to be a really key part of, of helping older adults get around if they want to. And if they can't, then they can drive. But it's about making people, maybe it's so no one's afraid to do so. Um, huh. so they can't, they want to, yeah. Well, that's, that's, I'm going to look into that. <laughs> I mean, I live, I love, I usually walk about five miles a, a day. So I really am into walking, but again, um, it's just a question of, cause I have a, an art studio up in San Rafael, but I have to drive. I live in Marin uh, in Mill Valley. I have to drive to it, but then. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's walk, too far. I walk into San Rafael all the time, just leave my car at my studio. So. Um, or to, you know, many, many things I can reach by leaving my car at my studio. But again, um, I'm pretty athletic and most people my age aren't. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I mean, if I can touch on one more thing, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you're, you have a studio in San Rafael and you live in Mobile. That, that's, you know, that's, that's a longer trip. But, you know, we know that in Marin, from the same survey we saw earlier, that more than half of trips, 57% of all trips are under five miles. So anytime you're driving around and, and stuck in traffic at a light, you know, on, on Sir Francis Drake or Magnolia, you're behind a lot of people who are actually making short trips, even though you may need to make a long one. And so one of the reasons that we see bicycles and bicycle safety as a way to, to have a lot of benefits, again, including to driving like that, and that study about the Netherlands I talked about earlier, is we, we free the roads for people who are making those longer trips. And all those people who are making the short trips you know, if it's just, you know, you're going from your house in downtown, you want to go to the Whole Foods and back, you should feel, if you have a, a, a bike that can carry some groceries, you should feel safe doing that. Or, 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 or somebody else who you're stuck behind in traffic, they should feel safe doing it so you can drive. Great. And just to answer your question, um, Marsha, about age, uh, this is somewhat older data. It's 2005 to 2013. This purple line is Marin. So we do have a significantly older population in comparison to the other Bay Area counties um, in Marin. Um, looks like a, it's grown from just under 44 to up to close to, looks like probably 45%. But again, this was 2013. Um, and so if the trend is continued, then we have a little bit even higher percentage or median age um, huh. for us here. So I saw a moment ago, um, Ro, did you have your hand up? Yeah, you know, I, this is wonderful and interesting and, you know, a lot of food for thought. 
And I, it got me thinking about golf carts and golf cart culture. I have relatives and friends in Rossmore over in the East Bay, which is a golfing golf course community. And it's designed so that, well, it is sort of an insular community, but a lot of people own electric golf carts and they leave the community and go down to the Safeway, which is, I don't know, about a mile away. Um, I also have relatives in Georgia that don't live in a golfing kind of community. They live in a woodsy lake kind of area. And a lot of people own these electric golf carts. But the thing is that the cities and towns um, have like specific lanes for them or they're wide enough that they can be shared with bicycles or two directions of these electric golf carts. So I just think it's kind of interesting when it comes to carrying, carrying um, groceries or packages or stuff, families, kids, um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think having, you know, what I am in favor is a diverse array of transportation choices. Um, you know, I, I think that, again, it's about like letting people use the thing that is best for them. If you have a quarter mile trip, you walk. If you have a one and a half mile trip, you ride a bike. If you have a three mile trip, you ride a golf cart. If you have a, if you're going up to Humboldt, you drive a car, like that's fine. Like there's, there's, there's no, no one's going to expect you to walk or even ride a bike up there. Um, it's just that we have for the last century, essentially in America, De design kind of a one size fits all solution. A car is the right vehicle for every single trip, no matter the distance. Um, and that and that has a you know so like you know you have people you know in like you know huge six thousand pound SUVs. I mean you know getting bigger you know dropping their kids off at school a mile and a half away when probably something it's you know it's like using a bazooka to go like dove hunting. It's like it's not the right you know it'll work, <laughs> but it's not necessarily the most efficient tool for the job. And it might have some collateral damage. Um, so, so I, you know, I'm, I'm all for, I'm all for, I'm, I, I'm not just all oh, bikes for everybody all the time. Like I'm not, I'm not well, as crazy. I'm not, I'm not like that. I, I think there's, uh, if again, if I'm going to Tahoe, I usually take the car, take my girlfriend's car. So, um, but it's a, it's about kind of right sizing our transportation system so people who have options and they don't have, they don't feel like they, we well, no one should be scared try and get to the store if, you know, if, if they want to do, get so, you know, do so on a bike or on a golf cart or walking or, you know, or taking the bus. And it's important to point out that pedestrian safety is a transit issue too, because every person riding the bus is a pedestrian on both ends of the trip. Um, so, so, you know, when we, you know, a lot of, and then, you know, yes. So it, increasing safety has a lot of benefits. Yeah, I like your use of the term collateral damage because I think it is sort of a visceral way to contextualize what the truth is. Um, you know, I feel like words like carbon emissions or, you know, like things like that, they kind of abstractify um, what the, the real footprint is or even footprint is probably an abstraction. Whereas there is damage that's happening at these different levels based on our current car centric, automobile centric uh, transportation system. Well, gosh, so normally um, we have at least a couple of guest speakers and I feel like we do a little bit more of a broad look, but it's been really nice to just kind of do this more focused in depth look with the, the bicycle piece and just sort of follow these different trails of how it's related to, you know, these different SDGs and these different topics. Um, so I feel like that's been kind of cool. <laughs> thanks for joining us, Warren. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys listening to me pontificate. <laughs> yeah, so we got something out of it. <laughs> does anybody have any last uh, questions for Warren before we wrap up our session today? Stacy. It's not a question, but I've been, this has been percolating ever since you mentioned the Netherlands. That's where I grew up. Oh, well, wow. fairly small town where the only two cars were owned by the two physicians in the town. So if you got sick, then the doctor would come with a car to your house. But the rest of life was done on a bike. And I was small during World War II. And so I didn't have my own bike. And it was a big 
event when my parents managed to, I don't exactly know how they did it, but different <laughs> parts of bikes were put together so that finally I could have my own bike to bike to school. Wow. Instead of walking or sitting on the back of my father's bike. But, um, you know, I, I didn't know how to drive when I came to this country. And I knew very few people who had cars. What a great story. <laughs> Thanks for that, Verena. That's great. You can see, I'm not born yesterday, but. <laughs> <laughs> I would never know. <laughs> what part of the Netherlands? Uh, what city? In well, it wasn't even a big city. Olmen. Okay. Zwolle. I was born in Zwolle. That's the bigger cool. the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the totally. headquarters. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Verena. And Stacy, did you want to slip in your question real quick? Uh, yeah, sorry. I My phone ran out of battery before. Um, I'm just curious, what's the next, uh, what is the Bicycle Coalition working on for improving the ability to bike on the roads of Marin? Great question. I love it. Uh, I love being teed up. Um, you know, so we're uh, actually in the process of kind of starting launching a new a new program at Warren County Bike Coalition. So historically, you know, we're you know, despite what you might see the you know in the the op ed page of the IJ, you know, we're not some huge bike lobby. We have nine staff, most of whom actually work on safe routes to school stuff. So you know, it, it's. It's not, we're not that big. And so, you know, we're, we're spread pretty thin. We have, you know, it's a, it's a large county geographically, 11 cities, non-incorporated county. Um, so we're trying to, we're really trying to build out our, our um, uh, kind of local organizing. So um, if you are a member of, if you're on our mailing list, maybe you have seen this. If not, I suggest you sign up. You can see my exciting writing all the time. Um, we're starting a, what's, what's called a local team in San Rafael. So we're um, going to be kind of, assembling a group of, of, of people who are interested in advocating for better biking and walking in their community, but but might not know how to, because local government is famously, you know, opaque and difficult to to understand. So we're going to be, you know, like have training, helping train people, helping people understand the the levers of their of their you know local government and 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 try to make the change and and, and actually um, facilitate their own goal setting. Um, in that group to say like, hey, what, you know, what are the campaigns? What, what are the biggest barriers to you? You know, we we have a kind of a big picture of the county. We understand, you know, I know the electeds, I know, you know, kind of the, the big policy things, but I might not know what's going on in a neighborhood. And so letting people who live in, in different communities and we hope to launch other local teams have to kind of iron up the kinks in San Rafael and, and, and actually add some staff hopefully to help manage it, to really, to really help people address their concerns in their neighborhoods, those goals that they're setting, and then help them build strategic plans and give them, provide them the technical expertise, expertise that we have as planners um, to help them execute on the, those goals. So, so it's not as concrete a question. It's not like this here's this one project, um, but it's more like really trying to um, be less reactive to what is happening in different cities and help the community members of Marin be more proactive in advocating for their own. Uh, preferred changes. Sorry, it's a lot of carbon right Thanks for that question, Stacy. That's very helpful. Yeah, that actually. One more thing, I just want to touch on this before I, because we've talked about housing, we've talked about housing a little bit, but I never, I never want to let this go. That one thing that I am working on, kind of separately, is so you know, everyone may be familiar with the uh, housing element updates that that Marin cities and this and the county are going through. You know, because of state law, which people can feel however they want to, you know, we are having to zone for more housing in Marin. And so one thing that I'm focused on, because I don't see this actually happening enough, is how do we make sure that that housing is, is bike ready and specifically e-bike ready? Because we, if we're, you know, everyone knows traffic's bad in Marin. We don't want to, if we're, if the 30,000 more households come here, we can't have 60,000 more cars. That would be crazy. So how do we make it, even with the best bike infrastructure, if you don't have a place to park your bike at home that feels safe and you have a small apartment, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're out of luck. Um, and so we already do require car parking for all new development. And I'm trying to, trying to, trying to push cities to say like, hey, can we look at Maybe reducing in some in some developments, maybe reducing that car parking minimum, and increase and providing you know a secure 
locked bike room on the ground floor for people to wheel in their bikes or if they have a cargo bike you can't haul that up a flight of stairs um you know electric bike to have that on the ground floor so that's that's another thing we're working on uh, kind of on a policy level not infrastructure but but something that hopefully that'll shape the future of marin in ways that people might not notice but it means that people who move here um or, or people moving out of their current house to another place in marin will be like oh my my house has a bike my, my apartment building has a bike room like I guess I can get that e-bike that, that I've been wanting, but I haven't felt safe parking outside. Great. Well, so we've learned today that we need to show up at these <laughs> at these meetings and say yes, yay, bikes, and not yeah. let the people who say no, bad, uh, be the voice that speaks for the rest of us. Also, uh, Warren, just to encourage you and the Marin County Bicycle Coalition to use the SDGs to invoke those. Cool. to make the point that you're not just working for, you know, as um, uh, as was mentioned earlier by Rick, the, the hobbyists, but also it is a question of social equity. It is a question of access. It is a question of, um, you know, if you care about wildlife. So um, it, those, those, uh, those icons are really handy um, for, for making those connections visually and very quickly, cool. you know, like number 10, reduced inequalities, you know, without having to kind of go into the specifics um, of, of to, to make those connections. So, well, gosh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and perhaps if you're, if you're feeling inclined, you can unmute yourself and we'll clap for our guest speaker, Warren. <laughs> thank you, Warren. Thank you so much for having me, Felicia. I really appreciate the invitation. It's always, always good to get to, to meet some, meet some new folks. Great. Um, and, oh, sorry. If go I ahead. Little, if I can little, give a little pitch at the end, if you, mm -hmm, um, yeah. if you're interested in being the, uh, getting on the, the MCBC newsletter. So I saw Felicia put our, our, um, our address in the chat. It's so it's Marin K or marinbike.org slash subscribe is a place where you can get, um, on our newsletter, you can unsubscribe if you don't like the content going forward, but it's a good place to uh, hear about the latest, find out about meetings that might be happening in your community that, that you could, um, send an email about or, or join in, uh, you know, have your voice heard. Um, and also if you're interested in becoming a member, marinbike.org slash join, you can join for the low, low price of $50 a year and support biking and, and walking in your community and reduce traffic. Great, an excellent newsletter to join. And then again, show up at the meetings. Um, and then as the UNA Marin County chapter, um, for those of you who may not know, we have been in the middle of this series of the SDGs every other month. So our next one will be number 12, um, responsible consumption and production, which might sound a little bit blase, but that's where we get into things like how full is our landfill? Uh, what about our consumer goods uh, consumption levels? How are we doing with that? Um, and how about the right to repair movement and all these sorts of interesting topics. So join us. We'll send out our newsletter to update you when we get closer to that date. And of course, if you are not currently a member of UNA USA, you are welcome to join um, at una-usa.org or our website, unamarin.org. All right. Thanks again, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Take care, buddy. Thank you, Felicia. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.